Right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Landmark Chambers webinar, Bill of Rights Bill webinar series, session two. We are delighted to see so many of you joining the session with us today and hope you will find the presentations and discussion to be useful and informative. Please note this is the second of three sessions uh, of we're doing a series about this with the third and final one taking place this Friday 8th of July. Having registered for this webinar you will receive a copy of the recordings and presentation slides for all sessions uh, in due course. My name is Samantha Broadfoot QC and I will chair the session today joined by my colleagues Alex Goodman, Yasa Vanderman and Alex Shattuck who I will formally introduce uh, in due course. To begin with a few housekeeping points to note. Your microphones are automatically muted throughout the session. Please uh, um, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. Uh, second, we very much welcome questions throughout the session. Uh, please submit them via text in the Q&A section which may be found at the top or at the bottom of your screen depending on your settings. If you would like to remain anonymous when asking a question, please make sure you tick the send anonymously box before submitting it. Thirdly, we will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. This uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, you will receive a link to the presentation uh, shortly after the event concludes. And if your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, we invite you to rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link uh, once more. So let us begin. By way of recap, uh, last week uh, in session one, we had a short overview of the bill by David Locke QC, um, an interpretation of convention rights uh, by Tim Bewley QC. Then we had Fiona Scolding QC giving the session on deference to Parliament and declarations of incompatibility. And finally, Charles Bishop, who gave a talk on the new permission stage. That's all available on uh, Landmark's YouTube channel. Today, we have three more fantastic lawyers who will be giving talks on positive obligations, devolution issues and interim measures. Uh, first up, we have Alex Goodman, who will be speaking about positive obligations. Alex practices in planning, environment and public law with a particular specialism in human rights. He's very well placed to speak to us on this topic, having acted in a number of cases in recent years on positive obligations under the Human Rights Act. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, the Queen again, uh, on behalf of MA and BB against the Secretary of State for the Home Department with the um, ERHC intervening, uh, it was held that there is a positive duty under Article 3 um, which necessitated that there should be a public inquiry into abuse in immigration detention centres. And Alex is currently in the High Court in a case for the NGO Women of Refugee Women concerning positive obligations under the common law to access justice for women uh, in immigration detention. So Alex, over to you. Thank you, Samantha. Talking of stalled by the proposed Clause 5 of the Bill of Rights. This is a very big topic on which uh, whole books have already been written. And if this clause becomes a section of an act on which no doubt more books will be written. Um, so all I can really do is give a flavour of the extent of the positive obligations that exist at the moment and the way in which the proposed clause five uh, will impact on obligations. The two things it seeks to do principally are to stem the evolution of further positive obligations under the um, 
living instrument type approach that the European Court of Human Rights uh, adopts. Uh, and the uh, other, other, other proposed in, or intended effect of Clause 5 is to in, row back on some of the previous interpretations of positive obligations. So I'll start just with Clause 5.1. This is the first part. There's more to the clause, but I'll take it stage by stage. And this provides that a court may not adopt a commencement interpretation of a convention right that would require a public authority to comply with a positive obligation. And if we drop down to uh, subparagraph seven, it says that in this section, positive obligation means an obligation to do any act. So the intention here, a court may not adopt a post commencement interpretation. So it's only uh, where issues arise after the passing of the act, uh, but it may not do so in a way that will require a positive obligation. So I just want to move on from there to the next slide. Um, the, to give an example of positive obligations in practice, uh, at the moment, uh, really positive obligations apply in the jurisprudence and indeed in the text of the convention, in at least, at least in relation to articles 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 11 and A1, P1, and potentially in relation to other articles as well. Some positive obligations are actually patent in the text of the convention itself, for example, the obligation to give reasons when arresting someone under Article 5.2. So I'll come back to that because Clause 5 seems to grate against the actual wording of the convention right in some respects. But other positive obligations derive really from three broad principles in the jurisprudence of domestic courts and the Strasbourg court. Um, Firstly, the overarching obligation on the state under Article 1 of the Convention to secure that everyone within the jurisdiction has the rights and freedoms set out in the Convention. Secondly, Article 13, the right to an effective remedy, although we don't, uh, that's, that's more of a Strasbourg point than a domestic one. And thirdly, the Convention, the convention principle that rights are not theoretical or illusory, uh, but practical. Um, moving on, the Examples, uh, if we can get slide two, three, articles two, three, and four provide examples of where the court has found there to be uh, positive obligations implicit within the rights, so not in the text, but implicit. So article two is the right to, is the right to life. Everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. So you can see there's a certain positive element there which the court has drawn on. Uh, article 3, no one should be subjected to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And Article 4, 1 and 2, no one should be held in slavery or servitude and no one should be required to perform compulsory labour. So in the next slide you'll see that positive obligations under Articles 2, 3 and 4, if we can move forward, uh, impose an obligation on the state to put in place a legislative and administrative framework designed to provide effective deterrence against threats to the right to life, or as it may be, uh, to be free from torture and human and degrading treatment, or to be free from forced labour and slavery. Uh, now that obligation implies, so say the courts, a requirement for an effective judicial system, legal means capable of establishing the facts and providing redress to victims. Secondly, the courts have also inferred an operational duty. In other words, the state must take appropriate steps to safeguard lives, to prevent torture, prevent forced labour. So I'll just give one example of that. So for a recent example, the case of VCA against the UK. And this was about uh, two uh, minors who were prosecuted for offences connected to working in a cannabis factory. And the very fact of working in a cannabis factory is itself often seen so that a person may be a victim of trafficking, the miners and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, the UK authorities prosecuted them and they 
uh, took this matter to the European Court, which held um, that there is uh, there's no express prohibition on the prosecution of trafficking victims uh, within the Convention, but there is within Article 4 a general duty on the state to take measures, operational measures, to protect uh, potential victims of trafficking where they are aware or should have been aware of circumstances giving rise to a credible suspicion that they might be victims of trafficking. And so in this case, the CPS and the police should have been aware there was a credible basis they may have been trafficked. And instead of prosecuting them, should have referred them to the competent authority, to the national level mechanism that we've set up to deal with uh, trafficking victims. And that indeed, by prosecuting them, it inhibited the ability of the trafficking victims to access those operational measures that were in place to safeguard their interests. And so um, there was a breach of the positive obligation to put in place those operational measures to protect them from slavery. So see paragraphs 174 through to 183 of the judgment, if you're interested. Um, also, there was a failure to conduct a timely assessment of whether they were victims of trafficking, which uh, was a further reason for the breach of Article 4. Um, the third category under these articles, two, three, four, four, is that there is uh, said to be a procedural duty intrinsic in Articles 2 of, uh, of potential breaches of those articles. So that's well established now in relation to the right to life under Article 2. Uh, see, for example, Amin. Uh, there, uh, it was said that in the House of Lords that there is a, a right to life and under Article 2, which requires the authorities to take steps to protect those who are incarcerated in prison uh, and then where a death does occur to undertake an investigation of what went wrong and there were minimum standards of review such as um, participation of the next of kin, uh, independence and so on. Um, another example is Middleton. Um, Middleton's a obviously a very important case on the right to life. Many of you will know the case, um, all about uh, uh, inquests. There was a prisoner serving a long custodial sentence. Uh, he died, uh, hanged himself in his prison cell. And his family alleged that the prison service knew or should have known that he was a suicide risk and he should have been on suicide watch. At the time, uh, the jury was restricted and the inquest to giving a verdict in traditional form, uh, which is a short form without any detailed reasons or finding of culpability by, uh, in terms of systems failures. Uh, and the uh, court held that um, the current regime didn't meet the requirements of, of Article 2 in those cases. So uh, since then, the whole procedure for reasons in, in, in inquest has been um, amended. Um, and then the third case, which I'm going to come back to, is MA and BB, which is a case I acted in, which is about the investigative, investigative obligation under Article 3. And that's a recent example, and in fact, the first case where domestically um, the Article 3 obligation has been held to require a public inquiry under the Inquiries Act 2005, it, uh, and which is now uh, concluded in relation to abuse in the Brookhouse Immigration Removal Centre. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment, so I'll, I'll deal with that. If we just move on to the next slide now. Um, I'm just going to continue my quick overview. Um, Article 6 has also been held to have uh, implied positive obligations within it. Uh, famous case, Airy against Ireland. Airy was getting divorced and the European Court said that uh, the proceedings were complex she would be too emotional to be objective with it if she had to present the case in herself, uh, for, in person herself. And so the possibility of acting in person without a lawyer where she had insufficient funds to pay was not an adequate safeguard. Um, and the government's argument was that Article 6 was limited to obstacles to accessing justice. So there are lots of cases where, for example, uh, prisoners can't, cases like Leach, Daly, Etc. in the uh, Anderson in the UK and they said well that's the that's why article 6 applies but um, 
the court said no, it could apply, could compel a positive obligation to provide legal aid. And so that has had an implication then for the UK legal aid system uh, in Gudena Vision, uh, in which it was said that the legal aid guidance was incompatible with Article 6 for being too restrictive in human rights cases. Um, we move on then to uh, Article 5 on the next slide. Now, this is a, a particular example that I've selected because Article 5.2 itself has a very clear positive obligation within its text. It says everyone who is arrested shall be informed promptly in a language which he understands of the reasons for his arrest and any charge against him. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see that this was uh, critical to the case of Saudi. Um, so if we go forward to, yeah. Uh, and in Saudi, this was the challenge to fast track detention when it was introduced in the early part of this century. Now in the House of Lords, uh, Lord Slynn said, um, it's agreed that the forms served on the claimant were inappropriate. It was to say the least unfortunate uh, but without going so far as Mr Justice Collins in his criticism of the Immigration Service, I agree with him that even on his approach, the failure to give the right reason for detention and the giving of no or wrong reasons, which was in fact no reasons in Saadi's case, did not in the end affect the legality of the detention. So in the House of Lords, Saadi got no remedy. However, he went to the European Court and complained of a breach under Article 5.2, the positive obligation to give reasons. And the court found a violation of Article 5.2 for failure to give reasons for detention promptly in fast track immigration detention. So one sees there how uh, a, a, a variation between the common law and the Article 5.2 right uh, pertains uh, and how it actually makes a difference having these positive obligations. But of course, this is a positive obligation that's written into the text. So if we go on to the next slide, we can see that that may cause some in its application. Um, if we think of second fast track under a new name, it's called the system of accelerated detained appeals. So pretty similar to detained fast track. Um, now, suppose we have Saudi again under this new system when the details have been published, the, the details are gonna be in subsidiary legislation, but Mr. Saadi detained, no reasons given for his fast track or accelerated detention. What happens following the passing of clause five of the Bill of Rights? Um, does it remain a violation of the positive obligation to give reasons in Article 5.2, applying Saadi to the new legislation? Or would this be the kind of case that the legislation is designed to restrain? So would the court say, no, no, to find a positive obligation to give reasons would involve the court adopting an interpretation that would require a public authority to comply with a positive obligation? Now, that's what Clause 5 says, that you can't require a public authority to comply with a positive obligation. So it creates quite a tension there because the wording requires a positive obligation, but the convention is implying positive obligations. Uh, if it does restrain the duty to give reasons uh, prompt, then clearly uh, an existing right is being legislated away in any new circumstances. Um, I wonder how the common law might evolve to fill that gap. Um, in Christian Lachinsky, of course, there is a, a common law duty to give reasons, but it didn't go so far as to affect the legality of Saudi's detention. So might we evolve a set, a, a, an equivalent to Article 5.2? A duty to give reasons that doesn't affect legality. It really thrusts some of the interpretive obligation back on the common law to fill the gaps that would be created. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so one can see from that example that really what the intention of Article 5.1 is to curtail the living instrument doctrine. So as you know, 
the convention is seen as a living instrument that adapts to societal circumstantial changes, just as, for example, the American Constitution would now prohibit discrimination or slavery, whereas obviously when it was, uh, when it was drafted, um, that was intrinsic to American society, but the constitutions are generally seen as evolving instruments. And so one sees, for example, well-known case of Goodwin against the UK about a post-operative uh, transsexual, and she was unable to ensure um, recognition of her uh, identity uh, in social security, national insurance, pensions and retirement age, etc., under UK legislation, and said this could be available to other persons which would expose her former gender identity. And what's interesting about the case is that there actually been three previous cases brought against the UK about its legislative frameworks, uh, which all of which had said, the European Court had said, did not violate Article 8, but the European Court decided, if we go on to the next slide, that in light of the developments in, in circumstances, um, it would depart from its previous uh, cases regarding transsexuals in the UK. Um, can we just see the next slide? And it says there, in light of present day conditions, it says, however, since the convention is first and foremost a system for the protection of human rights, the court must have regard to the changing conditions within the respondent state and within the convergence as to the standards to be achieved. It is of crucial importance the convention is interpreted and applied in a manner which renders its rights practical and effective, not theoretical and illusory. A failure of the court to maintain a dynamic and ev evolutive approach would indeed res risk rendering it a bar to reform or improvement. And so, of course, that's directly what Article 5.1 wants to achieve, is a bar to reform or improvement. So we, we ossify our rights as they stand at the date at which this act is passed. So if there are developed societal developments in 40, 50, 60 years, or gender identity was clearly not foreseen in the 1940s and 50s when the convention was drawn up, we will be unable to, the courts will be unable to respond to those developments. Um, that's the intention of, of the new clause five. Um, that will be left to Parliament to legislate. Um, so obviously there'll be more or potentially more of a lag time than there was with um, with gender identity uh, issues where the court said you know, three times it's within your margin of appreciation not to have amended your uh, legislation but the fourth time time's up you've got to catch up with social norms. Okay, can we move on to the next uh, slide? If we move on to the next slide, it's Clause 5.2 of the Bill of Rights. So we, we've dealt now with 5.1. That deals with a standstill on further evolution of positive obligations. 5.2 through to 6 are concerned with uh, ensuring that old positive obligation interpretations can, in some circumstances be revisited so rowing back on the scope of positive obligations as currently understood so the idea is that incrementally over time the courts will uh, chip away at the scope of positive obligations as understood under the uh, existing jurisprudence and it says in deciding whether interpretation of a convention rights that would require a public to comply with a positive obligation, the court must give great weight to the need to avoid applying an interpretation that would, and then we see, A, have an impact on the ability of the public authority or any other public authority to perform its functions, B, conflict with or otherwise undermine the public interest, C, require the police to protect individuals, D, require an inquiry or other investigation to be conducted to a standard that is higher than is reasonable in all the circumstances, and E, affect the operation of primary legislation. If we just go on, I'm going to come back to 5.2d, but if we go on to the next slide, um, we see that uh, there are some details of how this will work. And in essence, the way it will work is um, the existing case law is, 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 is kind of grandfathered uh, in, the, in a similar way to the Brexit legislation. Um, uh, but thereafter, uh, you can... Uh, 
proceed as you wish and you can go back over some of that case law as the intention. Um, let's go forward. So I just want to give another example to try and understand how these provisions work in practice. I'm going to the next slide. Uh, an example I want to give, sorry, that's too, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Uh, credible evidence. Um, this is the example of AM and BB. Now, this is the case that led to the Brook House inquiry pursuant to the Article 3 investigative duty. Um, the argument was there was credible evidence of potential torture and inhuman and degrading treatment in immigration removal centres, which arose from testimony, from documents, and in particular from undercover filming by Panorama of some horrendous abuse. The claimant said this needs to be investigated. The only effective way of investigating is by using the Inquiries Act 2005. The Home Office said no. The investigative duty is discharged by resolution, execution, civil claims for damages, parliamentary inquiries, an ad hoc inquiry by Stephen Shaw. And they said a public inquiry would be disproportionately costly. Um, but the court held that there was uh, an investigative duty which could not be fulfilled by all the disparate means the Home Office advanced. There was a need for compulsion of witnesses, so the wrongdoers had to be compelled to attend. That needed to be, that evidence needed to be heard in public and there needed to be fundable, funded representation. Now, this was quite a marginal decision. It's the first time that the Article 3 duty has been held to impose a, a, a requirement for inquiry of that kind. So um, if we move on to the next slide, we'll just see, would it make any difference? Um, well, the question is whether is capable of allowing this, this clause 5.2, that the, the Brookhouse inquiry was required to meet the requirement of effectiveness. Would clause 5.2 make a difference? Because 5.2D says that great weight has to be given to the uh, not conducting it to a standard that is higher than is reasonable in all the circumstances. Is there a difference between that and, and, this, and, and not meeting the standard of effectiveness? Well, that's the issue that would arise if this claim were to be argued again in the near future. Okay, I'm just gonna have to run through my last slides um, because we've only got this short amount of time to cover a huge topic. So uh, next one is um, a sweep up really. Uh, on Articles 8, 10, 11, and A1, P1. And I've just given a few examples of positive obligations. <clears throat> um, Connor's positive obligation to facilitate the gypsy way of life. There are loads of other positive obligations under Article 8 if you go through all the case law, extending to all sorts of things like protecting against environmental pollution. One can see that that is an area which will evolve over the coming years, but unfortunately, uh, uh, well, depending on your view, but should, should this clause be passed, the evolution in the UK will have to fall behind what European Court will find. So, for example, if Article 8 starts to become important in climate change cases, as it's done already in the agenda case in the Netherlands, um, to the extent those principles become established at Strasbourg level, following this uh, clause 5, then uh, the UK's jurisprudence will be will be stayed at, at where we are now and its extent, extension into positive obligations in relation to the environment will be curtailed. Um, similarly, um, just quickly on Article 10, it's quite an amazing case about the failure of state authorities to allocate broadcasting frequencies to a television company. That's uh, Article 10. And then Article 11, sometimes you have to protect protesters against counter-protests. And then A1P1, there's a few cases on securing sufficient property rights. So uh, I had to zoom through those last points, I'm afraid, just for space of time. There's plenty more that could be said, but thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Alex, for uh, that excellent canter through what is a very large uh, topic and is obviously going to uh, lead to a lot of head scratching in the future, but of course we don't know exactly what the final form of that clause will be when it's uh, passed. So, um, but thank you very much.
Uh, my next speaker is Yasa Vanderman, who's speaking on devolution issues. Yasa's practice covers public law and human rights, planning and environmental law, and protest law. He regularly appears at the appellate level. He's been instructed in eight Supreme Court cases since 2019, uh, and is also called to the bar of Northern Ireland. He's recently been involved in the abortion challenges in Northern Ireland and the ban to the vigil in Clapham Common following the murder of Sarah Everard. Yasa, over to you. Thanks, Sam, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I was about to, well, at that time of the day where I'm not sure whether to say good morning or good afternoon, so I won't say either of those. And I'll just say thank you for being here on what is presumably your lunch break. Uh, as Sam said, I'm going to be talking about devolution issues. Uh, a subject I'm particularly interested in because, as Sam has just said, I'm called to the Bar of Northern Ireland and I do a fair amount of work there. And it's also an increasingly topical area in light of kind of the debates in Scotland over independence and the debates with Northern Ireland over Brexit and the protocol and the like. Um, so it is, a, it is a fascinating issue in its own right. Uh, and actually, I don't think I'll take up too much time because, although important to know and significant, Actually, I think the relevant provisions and the issues um, arising in relation to devolution are not overly complex. So this is uh, my basic structure over the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, I've even included a case study because I thought it might be fun, but also helps to exemplify how the changes might actually operate in the devolution context. So looking first at the current position then, uh, and apologies for those of you who know this back to front, but I thought it was worth spelling out here because it is the essential backdrop to understanding the proposed amendments in the Bill of Rights Bill that we will come on to later. Um, and so in my mind, there are two main ways that the ECHR comes into play when we think about the devolved nations. Number one is uh, related to competencies. So legislate, as I've written out there, if legislation is made by the Scottish Parliament or the Senate or the Northern Ireland Assembly, if that legislation is incompatible with convention rights, then that's outside of their competence. And the effect is that, they, that that legislation is not law, it just doesn't take effect. Uh, and we see this um, in those provisions of Scotland Act, Government of Wales Act, Northern Ireland Act, which, which say that. And indeed, I suppose the effect is not unlike what you might see or heard of in the US, where the state or federal legislation is breaches of the constitution struck down. A similar kind of effect. Um, obviously, not the same as primary legislation made by Parliament in Westminster. Parliament is sovereign, so the primary legislation it makes will always have effect notwithstanding whatever a court says or whatever its compatibility with convention rights are. So of course a court can issue a declaration of incompatibility um, under section four of the Human Rights Act at the moment, but that does not stop the validity or effect of that primary legislation. Um, so it has basically political effects rather than deep than direct legal effects. So that's the number one way at the moment where the convention comes in. Involved nations, uh, how it's relevant. And number two, I've set out here is kind of what same as um, the kind of Section 6 Human Rights Act, point, which is individuals can challenge acts of public authorities as being compatible with the standard. Um, now, the crucial bit that I want you to take away is both in number two here and number one. Oh, what have I done there? Number one is that convention rights, so you see convention rights there, and convention rights there, taken from those provisions of those acts, are currently defined in all of those acts. And I should say the wording in all of these acts is materially identical. So I'm not going to, for now, generally distinguish between Scotland or Wales or Ireland. The wording is basically identical, so I'm going to refer to them all together. And in all of those, convention rights, that phrase, it's defined as having the same meaning as in the Human Rights Act. So you view it through the prism of the Human Rights Act. And that would be important when we come on to look at how that has now changed, which I call in the future position 
Uh, and so, where do we see the clauses in the bill in relation to the whole nations? We see them in clause 37, which, which simply gives effect to schedule five, which contains consequential and minor amendments, which I would describe as perhaps not the most tactful description of huge changes to the legislation and the legal position in the whole nation. Um, and schedule five essentially does one main thing, one main thing. What it does is it replaces all references in the bits we've just seen um, in those fundamental pieces of legislation, changes references of, to the Human Rights Act, changes it to the Bill of Rights 2022. So that, that's why I said that um, this talk could be 10 seconds long. I could have just said that. But obviously that brings with it issues that we're going to look at. But that, that is the one main thing it does in relation to the devolved nations. It, in Schedule 5, it goes through um, and it just says references to Human Rights Act to be replaced by Bill of Rights. A bit more complicated than that, but that's essentially what it does. Um, now, you might think, well, it might not have a big, doesn't seem a big deal, but no doubt you've been listening to my colleagues um, just now, but also in previous lectures, lectures, probably not the right, what is it, seminar, webinar, um, about the effect the Bill of Rights has and how it's different to the Human, Human Rights Act not in a way that actually does affect the substance of the convention rights. So that's why this is significant, not because even though it's a small change, technically in substance actually um, has a big, has, makes a big difference. So let's see that a bit more close. I'm gonna put it under a magnifying glass. The top bit is the same as before. I'm still referring to the two main ways in which we can see convention rights coming in. And that legislation isn't being changed. It will still refer to incompatibility with the convention rights when it comes to competence. But, and this is why I said it was important earlier, but convention rights for the purposes of those provisions would be amended under the Bill of Rights 22 so that it, the convention rights has the same meaning as in the Bill of Rights 2022. And that's significant, as I say, because the Bill of Rights itself gives a different meaning to the convention rights as compared to the Human Rights Act. And then saying exactly the same point here, when individuals want to challenge acts of public bodies saying, I've breached my convention rights. Again, although the reference to convention rights will remain in those pieces of legislation, in those sections that I've set out, convention rights is defined in such a way as to be viewed through the prism of the Bill of Rights. So again, it will have the same effect as it will be the case in England and Wales, it is in England. So that's my um, omnibus conclusion, subtle change with a big effect, and it means that the world authorities, just like perhaps in England, will have to comply with convention light, so a real a substant, substantive change to the human rights obligations. Uh, and just for completeness, I've put it here, clause 16 does refer specifically to the default nation. You can see I can, you can see I got tired at this part of my uh, preparing my presentation because I'm at the moment and now I'm just referring to them as S W and N I I can't even bother to re type out the full names but uh, clause 16 refers specifically to Scotland Wales and Northern Ireland um, but not with any change that I would consider particularly significant it just says that the claim has to be evicted which is in any event requirement of in the Human Rights Act and in the Convention itself. Uh, what about the Belfast Agreement, I hear you say? Well, you may have seen some press or blog posts about uh, the impact of repeal of the Human Rights Act on the Belfast Agreement, and there have been quite a couple of well-known organisations that say it will lead to kind of problems and breaches of the Belfast Agreement. Um, in fact, if you go through the Belfast Agreement, the Human Rights Act isn't mentioned, which perhaps isn't surprising, given that the Belfast Agreement was signed in April 98, and the Human Rights Act got all assent in November. I think. Uh, so obviously it wouldn't refer to an act that hadn't been passed yet. Uh, but what does the Belfast Agreement actually say? And I hope to set out there uh, the bits of the agreement, strand one and strand three, which refer to the convention. Um, obviously important that the convention be incorporated into Northern Ireland law to provide protection. Um, so on one view, you could say, 
well, the Bill of Rights doesn't change anything because it still gives effect to the Convention and the Belfast Agreement only talks about the Convention and its incorporation. And I'm sure um, that might be what the government say. Another view is that, in fact, the Bill of Rights is incompatible with the Convention. See the talks of my colleagues, see Alex's talks, see the talks the other day. Um, and therefore, if it were passed, it could not be said that there had been proper incorporation of the Convention into Northern Ireland domestic law, um, as opposed to, I suppose, purported incorporation. Now, that's that's obviously uh, a sensitive political issue rather than necessarily a legal one, because we know and confirmed in the Alistair case, which was, by the way, a huge judgment um, involving a challenge to the Northern Ireland Protocol. I think it was over 600 paragraphs. So I've saved you having to read it for this point which is that the Belfast Agreement is not part of domestic law and so cannot produce or create directly binding rights. So as I say, it's a political issue. And then the, the, the much hyped case study, uh, I thought it'd be useful to add some flavour to my talk. Not that it needed it, but by reference to a case study, and I'll be quick, um, so I can see time running away. Um, and it's a topical case study because I, actually I'm involved in the case. Uh, I think the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission being heard by the Supreme Court in a couple of weeks. That obviously means I can't say much about it. I'm not going to go into the issues really, but it does provide a useful example of the sorts of changes that Bill of Rights could make to a case like this. Um, and it, so it involves the abortion services, safe access zones bill. Some of you may well know about it. It was a private member's bill introduced by Claire Bailey and it completed its final stages at the end of March. Uh, and I set out the third sub bullet there criminalizes certain protests outside abortion clinics. And you can see 52A is the provision, I suppose, being referenced to the Supreme Court by the Attorney General of Northern Ireland, which says it's an offense to, to act in a safe access zone with the intent of or reckless as to whether it has the effect of influencing a protected, protected person, whether directly or indirectly of influencing. Um, and as I said, there's a mechanism in the Northern Ireland Act and in the other devolved pieces of legislation, which are now reference has been made to the Supreme Court on legislation as to whether it's compatible or not with convention rights. Um, and the Attorney General is arguing in that case that the blanket prohibition um, on pure protests, so whether you try to influence someone, but no kind of certainly non-violence involved. Um, so that prohibition without reasonable excuse breaches Article 10 and 11. Um, and perhaps even nine, and therefore it's outside the competence of the Northern Ireland Assembly. So that's the argument. So my question is not to delve into that case, which no doubt will be, be argued um, in detail in the next couple of weeks, but my question is this, which is how would this case and the arguments be affected by the Bill of Rights if it got passed? Um, uh, because the safe access to those would be outside the competence, of the assembly if it was a compatible convention rights as seen through the prism of the Bill of Rights. So one clause that you may be aware of is 472, which is the court must have, uh, must regard parliament as having decided in passing the act that the act strikes an appropriate balance as between the matters mentioned. Um, and that's all to do with competing convention rights and policy priorities, etc., and give the greatest possible weight to that principle um, that parliament should strike that balance. So would that affect the arguments there? Well, no, because that refers specifically to Parliament and to acts. And acts are defined in the Interpretation Act as an act of Parliament, unsurprisingly. So actually, 72 wouldn't directly bite on the issue because uh, the reference is about um, a Northern, uh, an assembly, a piece of legislation emanating from the assembly, so not an act of Parliament. How else could it be affected? Well, clause 4.1 of the Bill of Rights says, court must give great weight to the importance of protecting the Article 10 rights. So you'd think, well, that might affect it in the future. But see the exception in clause 4.3a, which says that doesn't apply to claims where the, whether a provision of primary or subordinate legislation that creates a criminal offence is incompatible with the convention right. So that is actually exactly the, the safe access zones case. Um, it is a piece of legislation that emanated from the assembly. So it's subordinate legislation, not primary legislation, but it still falls within that. And so clause 4.1 wouldn't apply. We then have clause 10, 
uh, which is about declaration of incompatibility in the bill. And that says applies where a provision of subordinate legislation, so could apply here because that's what we have, is incompatible and does not cause the provision or declare it invalid by reason of incompatibility, then the court may make a declaration that the provision is incompatible. So it could apply, certainly could apply to um, pieces of legislation in Northern Ireland and in other um, civil nations, but wouldn't apply in the facts of the reference case, because the reference case is about whether the provision is outside the competence of the assembly. And if it's outside the competence, it's never law. So there would be no question of the court having to consider what relief it would grant, because by definition, there would be no law and that would have to be the relief. And then clause 23.2, which says, in considering whether to grant any relief which might affect the exercise by a religious organization, article nine rights, obviously about freedom of um, manifest one's religion and beliefs, the court must have particular regard to the importance of the right. So that could, in theory, have, um, uh, if someone, if an individual brought a challenge saying that I shouldn't have been arrested because that's a breach of Article 9 right because I was praying in this access zone um, uh, and I was criminalised for that, then it might apply in that case, but it wouldn't apply in the reference case because, as I said, that's all about competence and um, that's all about competence. And so there's no question of court deciding what relief to grant because it will just would not be law if it's found to be incompatible. So I think that's a long way of me saying <laughs> on the facts of the case that I've spoken about actually the Bill of Rights wouldn't seem to make a huge amount of difference but hopefully for the reasons I've drawn out as I've gone through there are um, in, in, in cases very closely related cases that could be brought on that kind of issue it would have quite a big impact on how the court would consider um, consider the issues. Right, and then I've gone to procedure, which I have to admit isn't the most sexually named title of slide, but it is quite sexy because what I'm thinking about here is how does the Bill of Rights, do the devolved authorities have a say in whether the Bill of Rights affects them? And the question is to a limited extent because, um, well, the question I pose is, do the devolved nations have to take the Bill of Rights lying down? And in a sense they do because Westminster had the power to legislate for those nations but no civil convention which is not law but it's contained in a memorandum of understanding between the, the authorities from 1999 which says the UK Parliament will not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the consent of the devolved legislatures so that would be the process that would have to be gone through uh, probably it seems likely I guess that many the nations will not grant their consent and then the question is well will the refusal stop the UK government and I think yesterday um, you'd probably well a few weeks ago you'd say well probably not but obviously that development's happening with the government as we speak so I can't speak for a potential future government um, but uh, let's assume that refusal wouldn't stop them because I think the Bill of Rights is very important. Um, a separate question I suppose and I've question is other pushback is could they do anything else to amend the operation of the Bill of Rights and the answer to that is that it's difficult and probably not because each of the devolved legislatures are currently prohibited from modifying the Human Rights Act and therefore in future when the amendment takes place the Bill of Rights 2022 and we see that in the Scotland Act Schedule 4 paragraph 1 we see that in the Government of Wales Act Schedule 7b paragraph 5.1 and in the Northern Ireland Act, Section 71b. So they say you cannot modify the working of the Bill. They will say it's amended the Bill of Rights. That's not to say that they won't try, nor that it's impossible to do some tinkering around the edges. But I think what I have to say is that probably not going to be easy. And I say that particularly following, you may have heard of it, the Scottish reference to the Supreme Court a few months ago, whereby they try to incorporate essentially the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, in a way that affected UK-based Parliament um, and in the Supreme Court there was very uneasy with the devolved nation bring forward legislation which will have the effect of altering the meaning of UK legislation so that there is that um, sensitivity there that is that cautious and from the Supreme Court at the moment and so I think it would be difficult for a devolved nation at the moment to try and modify substantive workings of the Bill of Rights 2022, but no doubt we will see. <laughs>
But thank you, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Yasa. Uh, that was extremely interesting. Right, our final speaker in this session is Alex Shattuck, who's going to be talking about uh, procedural changes, including interim measures. And I think it's largely about interim measures, actually, for reasons that he'll say. But um, Alex's practice focuses on equality, human rights, and environmental claims. He recently acted for the claimant in the successful Napier Barracks litigation with Alex Goodman and Charles Bishop. And he has particular experience acting on behalf of NGOs and vulnerable individuals. Alex, tell us about procedural changes and interim measures. Great, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, hello, audience. Um, my brief is to discuss with you procedural changes, um, including interim measures. But I've recently reviewed uh, our seminar program, and I see there is an extensive smorgasbord of patented landmark chambers commentary on the Bill of Rights, um, or the Bill Bill, uh, as I like to call it. And I've discovered that my colleagues all address various procedural matters um, in their excellent um, talks. So among that delectable cornucopia, you will find talks on the permission stage, declarations of incompatibility, the procedures regarding, de regarding deportation, um, and the procedures regarding freedom of expression, all on YouTube, um, ad-free with YouTube Premium, which obviously isn't worth it. Um, and so given that, I would just address interim measures, um, not those other procedural changes. Um, and that works well for me because as a public lawyer, uh, I am naturally averse to civil procedure. In any event, uh, civil procedure can so often be uh, a barrier to justice in my experience, um, pesky time limits, etc. So interim measures, what does the bill say, the bill bill uh, say about interim measures? Well, it says this, it's in clause 24. Um, no account is to be taken of any interim measure of the European Court of Human Rights for the purposes of determining the scope of rights, uh, and no account is to be had to an interim measure uh, for the purposes of granting relief either, which is a uh, quite strong wording um, indeed. Now, I understand that interim measures have been in the news a lot recently, which might have something to do with this, but unfortunately, I'm too busy to read the news, so I haven't been keeping up with any of that. Um, and so from my point of view, it's really quite baffling what the driver is behind this new clause. Um, I checked and interim measures weren't mentioned at all in the government's extensive consultation on the bill, uh, but then this clause just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, it was first announced in the government's updated consultation response towards the end of June this year seems to have been crowbarred in. Maybe something was going on um, at the end of June this year. I don't know, don't have time to read the news, but potentially a very strange addition. Um, now, before going into what all this means, I thought I would explain what interim measures are, because it might be, I don't know, but it might be that they get um, a bad rep. So most international courts um, can issue interim measures, um, notably the International uh, Court of Justice, famous case, the Lagrande case, uh, Germany and the US, and the ICJ in that case held that its interim measures were binding on states in international law. Uh, we'll get into why that's the case um, with the convention um, in a moment. Um, but you'll have probably clocked that the convention doesn't mention interim measures. We find them instead um, in the rules of court, Rule 39 in particular. Court may, under Rule 39, indicate interim measures to any state party to the convention, indicate interim measures. Interesting wording, indicate, very subdued. Um, certainly I've indicated my views on this bill to numerous colleagues. Um, but when are interim measures actually used by the court? When are they indicated? Well, in the court's own words, interim measures are urgent measures which, in accordance with the established practice of the court, um, apply only when there's an imminent risk of irreparable um, damage, and there's a case against Turkey which sets that out. So in the court's case law as it currently stands, interim measures are not used, for example, in the following cases. They're not um, used to prevent the imminent demolition of property. They're not used uh, in the case 
of imminent insolvency. They're not used to prevent the enforcement of an obligation to do military service. They're not used to obtain the release of an applicant who's in prison pending the court's decision as to the fairness of the proceedings. They're not used to ensure the holding of a referendum. They're not used to prevent the dissolution of a political party. They are not used to freeze the adoption of fairly serious constitutional amendments, such as those affecting the terms of office of members of the judiciary. So the Strasbourg court is just not interested in indicating interim measures in any of those quite serious, potentially quite serious situations. Um, and that's because um, interim measures are only indicated in a very limited number of circumstances. The most typical ones, uh, the typical cases are those where there's a threat to life. So a situation falling under Article 2 of the Convention or a threat of torture or ill treatment prohibited by Article 3 of the Convention. So the bottom line is it has to be a decision of a state with pretty appalling potential consequences um, for the court to even think about granting interim measures, indicating them. I should say, which makes it all the more peculiar that the government is now telling UK judges that they must ignore these measures. Now, I've explained the circumstances in which they are so indicated by the court. What is the legal basis for them, though? I hear you ask. Is this a case of unaccountable foreign judges trying to despicably apply universal human rights standards to humanity without humanity's consent? In other words, did we sign up to this? when we joined the convention? Well, I would argue absolutely we did. Firstly, the basis for the power to indicate interim measures or the vires, if you like, I don't like the word um, vires because I was never taught Latin, but national and indeed international courts, they love Latin, it's really annoying. But as I said, um, before interim measures come, uh, well, interim measures come from the rule of, rules of court, they're not specifically mentioned in the convention itself. Um, so where do they come from? Well. Firstly, there's nothing in the convention to stop the court indicating interim measures either, I should say, as seems to be suggested um, by a few in the com uh, commentariat. Um, secondly, interim relief is, in my view, an obvious and entirely orthodox thing to a court for a court to be granting. All the other international courts do it pretty much. All domestic courts grant interim can grant interim relief. Um, and thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the power flows naturally from the purpose of the convention, in my view. Now, let's say, completely hypothetically, um, a state wanted to deport a vulnerable asylum seeker to a country with a poor human rights record. Um, let's say the asylum seeker challenged this decision on human rights grounds, um, and let's say that this state's courts refused to do anything to prevent the deportation while the appeal progressed through the domestic courts. Now, I appreciate this is quite an extreme hypothetical, but bear with me. Um, now, this asylum seeker could, in theory, apply to Strasbourg at the very end of the process. But in the hypothetical case, sadly, after he or she was deported, the asylum seeker, in fact, um, disappeared, was potentially killed in this faraway um, country. We don't know what happened to them before they got a chance to bring the claim. Now, it seems to me in that kind of situation, um, the rights in the convention would be utterly meaningless if there was no mechanism for Strasbourg to direct the offending state not to deport that particular individual. Personally, and it's only my own personal view, I don't see how a system of international human rights could possibly work um, if the top court uh, in that system was prevented from saying to states, please don't put people at risk of torture or death until we have a chance to look at the matter. It seems a fairly mild baseline, if you ask me. Um, and as I said, if the state was only going to knock someone's house down or, or let them languish in prison, um, the Strasbourg Court, European Court of Human Rights would say, crack on, don't let us stop you. So again, very extreme circumstances when these measures are actually used. So that's the basis um, of the power. Um, but why do states have to listen uh, to the court when that power is exercised? Where is the obligation to comply uh, with interim measures? Um, and why, in fact, do states um, comply? Um, well, the case law on this provides two bases in the convention for the binding nature of interim measures, and that's Article 1 and Article 34. Article 1 first, fairly straightforward. Let's take a hypothetical example um, of a, a deported asylum seeker. Um, their rights um, have clearly not been secured if they have been tortured or killed uh, prior to the finding that their rights have been breached. Uh, the finding of unlawfulness at the end would be a very small consolation. Um, so it seems to me ignoring an order of the court seeking to prevent that outcome uh, would quite clearly be a failure to secure the rights of that individual under Article 1 um, of the Convention. 
Um, then we have Article 34 as well. This is all about access to the Strasbourg court. Um, the court may receive applications from any person, non-governmental organisation or group of individuals, et cetera, et cetera. The high contracting parties undertake, they undertake not to hinder in any way the effective exercise of this right. Um, and again, fairly straightforward. If you're put in a situation um, by a state that threatens life or limb uh, prior to an application uh, to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, your right um, to go to the European Court of Human Rights um, has been hindered. Obviously, it has. Um, I'm not quite sure what's so controversial um, about this. In my view, my own personal view, it's just common sense. Um, so again, ignoring interim measures um, is a breach um, of this convention uh, provision. But don't just take my word for it. There are two convention cases um, on this very um, issue. Um, Mamakulov um, and Askarov um, and Pallardi um, as well. Uh, and I've provided a quote from the court, which basically sets out um, everything um, I've just said. So the legal basis for interim measures, um, fairly straightforward, um, but it is inconvenient um, if you want to do things um, that potentially risk people's lives, um, which bring me um, neatly back to the text in the bill. Um, now, looking at these provisions um, in light of the previous analysis, um, to take no account of interim measures is to breach Article 1 uh, and Article 34 um, of the Convention. It's therefore inescapable, in my view, that this is a direct um, instruction to UK judges to put the UK in breach of international law um, by ignoring important measures that are ultimately um, designed to save people's lives. Um, now, if I may be, may be permitted to break character just for a moment, I, I do care a lot about international law. Um, my doctorate was about international law, so I spent far too long thinking about it. Um, and I have to say, um, like so many other parts of the bill, um, Clause 24 saddens me um, greatly. Um, and it's also quite, quite sad to me that we live in a time where I have to give a presentation on this kind of legislation. It's all quite depressing, um, but that's probably the, the mildest way I can put it. But um, I'm happy to, to give any other indications of my view um, on this bill on request. But anyway, back to the presentation, we've covered what the proposals are, we've covered what interim measures are, the legal basis for them, the consequences of breaching them, and the fact that judges are now being instructed to break international law. But we still haven't got to the bottom um, of why the government would want to ignore interim measures in the first place. Um, it seems that it wasn't on their mind when they consulted on the bill. Um, and given how sparingly interim measures are used, as I said, um, strange why they would want to ignore them. Um, but in, in order to solve this mystery, I thought, you know what, I'll have a look at the recent interim measures that the court has indicated in the last few months, particularly those related to the UK. Maybe there's something there that can give us a clue as to why these new provisions have been added to the bill. And you know what, it's a good thing I checked. I did find a case that was very relevant to the UK. Now, this was a case from June this year. Um, it was about two captured British soldiers who'd been fighting in Ukraine, uh, and they'd been uh, captured and sentenced to death. And as an interim measure um, under Rule 39, uh, the European Court of Human Rights told Russia not to carry out a death sentence against those two British soldiers pending their human rights claim. And I'll just leave you with this thought. If I was a Russian official looking at this order from the European Court of Human Rights telling me not to execute these British citizens, um, and I was wondering how do I respond to this, I think I would be very interested um, in what the UK government is currently saying about interim measures and whether they should be followed. Um, and I might well find um, that the UK government has given me some very helpful arguments that I could deploy uh, to help justify um, what I want to do with these British nationals. Um, and I'll say no more than that. Um, thanks very much for listening. I think we're now going into the Q&A part of the uh, session. Yes, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, that's really... Uh, excellent and what a treat to have smorgasbord and cornu cornucopia in one sentence during a presentation about interim measures so thank you very much uh, for that if the um, other panelists would turn on their videos that would be great now we don't have questions in the 
uh, Q&A specifically, but we have been emailed um, one or two. And uh, actually, Alex uh, Shattuck, I wonder if I can start with you. Um, I agree that usually interim measures are reserved for um, potential breaches of Article um, 2 and 3 cases, but I think it has on occasion also been used to prevent the separation of families where there are children involved and, um, and it would be a breach of Article 8, or at least highly arguably a breach of Article 8 to separate uh, a family. Have you come across that? Um, and uh, or do you think that that is perhaps a bit old um, now? Because I think the case I'm thinking of is probably from the early part of the 2000s. It was a case against Denmark. No, I, th I think that's absolutely right. Um, according to the um, European Court of Human Rights um, sort of fact sheet, and their fact sheets are generally brilliant, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's mainly sort of deportation style cases or cases where someone is about to be um, tortured but that doesn't limit the use um, of interim measures it, I'm, I'm, I'm certain you're right on that particular um, example and there are other circumstances as well I suppose that my point was there are lots of circumstances where they won't um, impose an interim um, measures and that some of the examples are you know fed not as strong as, as those kind of breaches but um, they are um, pretty strong nonetheless, but uh, no, it's not just limited to um, to Article 1 and Article 2. Um, there can be other, again, fairly extreme circumstances where it can be, um, those measures can be indicated as well. Yes, and, and if, an ex if um, it was necessary to actually see what a change this clause is by comparison to the current position, uh, I know from doing case involving interim measures recently that actually the Home Office's own guidance says that, a st you know, that uh, it would obviously comply with any Rule 39 indication given by the European Court. So certainly this clause is a considerable change from certainly the declared position um, in policy terms. Uh, thank you. Um, another question that uh, has uh, come in relates to whether it would be possible, I think this must be for you Yasa, whether it would be possible to uh, for the devolved legislatures to bring in their own increased protection for human rights. So if could they, um, even though this Bill of Rights bill is intended to be UK wide and apply uh, to Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, as well as England, uh, would it be possible for a devolved nation to bring in a piece of legislation which sought to effectively uh, retain um, the provisions of the Human Rights Act. So could they bring in, you know, Human Rights Act, brackets, Wales um, Act, if they wanted to retain that approach? What, what do you think, Yasa? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I think it really depends, as a lawyer, a good lawyer always says, it always depends on exactly what they try and do. Right? Devil will be in the detail. If they try and do something which does kind of modify or contradict something that's said in the Bill of Rights Bill, then they won't be able to do that because um, the Northern Ireland Act, the Scotland Act, the Government of Wales Act says that they're not allowed to modify the Human Rights Act and in the future the Bill of Rights. Uh, but I suppose there, there is potential, I don't know what it looks like, but I suppose there is a potential for them to bring forward legislation which doesn't contradict or modify, but in some other way helps bring in some human rights protection. But as I said, I'm not entirely clear what that looks like. And as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier as well, any such legislation would probably be referred to the Supreme Court um, to see whether it falls within the competences, um, uh, whether it seeks to modify an entrenched act like the Bill of Rights Act, Bill of Rights 2022, um, and may well because of the stance, it's particularly Westminster-centric stance that the Supreme Court has been taking recently when it comes to the world cases. Okay, oh, thank you. Yes, um, and then I think a question that uh, I found quite difficult is that although, um, I think this is for you Alex Goodman, about positive obligations, uh, sometimes it's not always clear, is it, to work out what is a positive 
and what is a negative obligation because you can frame the question in different ways depending and I, I wondered whether assuming that the clause survives whether you think there might be an increase in people trying to frame uh, the question the other way around to, to get round it. Did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I agree. That's a that's that's a conceptual difficulty that will obviously lead to a lot of um, new litigation in a way that's unnecessary in a sense at the moment because there isn't this artificial dividing line being drawn. So one can freely use the term positive obligation without fear that it might fall on the wrong side of some sort of definition. Um, but I agree, once you've got a definition that says positive obligations can't be relied on, then obviously you'll have to um, reconstrue all the rights that you're, you're relying on as something that isn't a positive obligation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's inevitable. I mean, I think it, you know, it's indicative of we've got to a point now where after 20 years of the Human Rights Act, quite a lot of the principles are finally settled. And this will take another two decades to, to work out, you know, just even a point like that, you can imagine a huge number of cases just as there were on something like section three of the human rights act yes that's uh, I, I can see that and i think um we do have a question uh in our q a uh which i think is for you alex shattuck uh which says clause 24 seems to be about what the courts do in granting interim relief on domestic under domestic law would it not be possible for the government to still comply with the Rule 39 interim measure, even with Clause 24? Would this still be an issue for the courts in relation to Articles 1 and 34 of the European Court of Human Rights of the European Convention and Clause 12, the new Section 6? That's an interesting um, question because I suppose the government says it's always had this policy that it complies with international law so if there is still a policy that says that we will comply with interim measures then I suppose theoretically there's no reason why it couldn't apply notwithstanding the court but then it sort of begs the question what's the what's the point of this um, and I did my best not to um, say the word um, Rwanda during my presentation but now I'm no longer giving my presentation I think a good example of this would be the interim relief hearing which was ultimately um, un unsuccessful there um, if prior to that hearing an interim measure um, had been issued, um, then presumably the courts would say, well, there's been an interim measure issued, therefore that weighs heavily in the uh, the second part of the, the balancing test. So the uh, sort of modified American cyanamide test, um, balance of convenience, and then um, the, uh, where, no, no, sorry, tribal issue, and then where the balance of convenience lies, the second part of the test. Um, so that could that could be completely ignored by, by a judge now. Um, so, um, the, there's a real a real danger that if the courts can't have any regard to it, then you just get the same outcome and then they would be sent back. Um, and certainly, I don't think this government's policy is to comply with interim measures. Um, if it was, then that's contrary to what they, they were saying when the interim measures were released, because they were quite, quite unhappy um, with them at the time. So, yes, in theory, but I don't think under this government that would be the case, because what's the what's the point of putting this provision in in, in, the, in the first place when it's I think it's clearly designed to allow us to get around in interim measures. Yes, mm. that's very interesting. Uh, do you have a Yasser or Alex Goodman, do you have a, anything you want to add to that? No. Good. Right. Well, uh, I think that will be uh, it for today's uh, seminar. Thank you very much for coming thank you very much for staying and um, hopefully we'll see some of you back uh, on Friday the 8th of July for part three and uh, thank you all very much uh, goodbye <laughs>